So here is an example where a subordinate manages to bail out his superior through quick thinking, if you will. And both of these gentlemen, you know, Wade McCluskey rightly goes home looking like a hero. Because he was the guy whose command decisions put those squadrons in a position where they could actually do something meaningful on the battlefield. So, you know, Wade gets his Navy Cross and retires a rear admiral. Good on him. And Dick Best, he doesn't look too bad either. You know, he also gets the Navy Cross, the Distinguished Flying Cross as well. He's one of only two pilots in this battle that are going to hit two aircraft carriers because he's going to go out and attack the Hear You later on this afternoon. So, if ever uh, a boss needed to buy someone's minion a beer when they returned to Pearl Harbor, I think that Wade McCluskey would tell you that I, he would cheerfully do that. So now, <clears throat> having executed the first of those attacks, really, the initiative now passes to the Japanese in this battle. The Americans have shot their bolt. You know, our, our torpedo plane squadrons have been decimated. The dive bombers are all either trying to struggle back to the aircraft carriers, they're running low on fuel, a lot of them are going to ditch. Um, so at this point, we have no ability to really follow up on the attacks that we've just delivered. It's really going to be in the hands of the Japanese for the next few hours to determine how the course of this battle is going to go. And that is going to be a set of decisions made by these two gentlemen. Uh, we have Vice Admiral Nagumo Chuichi, who is the commander of Kido Butai. And we have Rear Admiral Yamaguchi Tamon, who is the commander of Carrier Division 2 and who is currently standing on the only operating flight deck left to the Japanese fleet. These two gentlemen have worked very closely together now for the past 14 months or so. Um, ever since Kido Butai was put together organizationally in April of 1941, and then they've both been intimately involved in the planning for Pearl Harbor. Um, and the carrier operations after that in places like the Indian Ocean and so forth. So these guys have been in very close contact for a pretty long time. They don't really like each other. Um, and it's kind of easy to, to see why. Um, Nagumo is a cruiser admiral. He doesn't really have much experience with air power. And it's interesting because if you, if you look at what the, the formation of Kido Butai meant, this was a truly revolutionary development in the history of naval air power. This is the first occasion upon which any Navy has created a unified tactical organization that has enough carriers and enough air power to put together big coordinated strikes of aircraft and actually do strategically meaningful things on the battlefield. I mean, it's no stretch to say that there was no other navy in the world that could do an attack like Pearl Harbor except the Japanese navy at this point in time. So you would have thought that when they put together Kido Butai that they would also pick an air power advocate to lead that force, but that's not the case. Instead of reaching out to someone like an Admiral Onishi or an Admiral Ozawa, they picked Nagumo, mostly for reasons of seniority. He was the right guy with the right rank at the right time. You're the man. And unfortunately, his leadership style and his lack of his lack of an innate grasp about the kind of weapon system that he has under his command leads to some friction with, with other subordinate commanders within Kido Butai, and one of them is Yamaguchi. Yamaguchi is an air power advocate. He's been associated with air power for a number of years. He's also a very strong-willed, outspoken uh, individual, and he's made his opinions known to people like Admiral Ugaki, who is Admiral Yamamoto's right-hand man, he said, I really don't think that the leadership of First Air Fleet is flexible enough, and if they run into uh, changed circumstances on the battlefield, I don't know that they're really up to the drill. And Ugaki is told him point blank before he leaves for Midway, well, Admiral Yamaguchi, if, if you think there are times when you should speak up and, and let Nagumo know your opinion, uh, you should definitely do that. And Yamaguchi is the, definitely the kind of guy who would do that. Um, one famous vignette during the planning for Pearl Harbor, um, Soryu and Hiryu didn't really have the range to get to Oahu and back from Japan. And at that point, the Japanese had not yet developed the underway replenishment uh, capabilities to make that sort of thing happen. And so Cardiv 2 was dropped from the attack roster. That really made Admiral Yamaguchi very angry, and in a drunken rage, he put Admiral Nagumo in a headlock and demanded that Cardiv 2 be returned to the roster for that attack and that if, it was, if the only way they could do that was to scuttle uh, Hiryu and Soryu off, to the, off the coast of Oahu after the attack, well, so be it, which is a relatively interesting approach to force allocation, but there you have it. So 
This isn't the kind of guy that you would expect to hold his tongue, you know, when the chips are down. So, you know, the immediate problem for the Japanese, of course, is what do we do? We've just had three of our aircraft carriers taken out of the roster. We're left with Hiryu. Um, there's no question, of course, that we should counter-strike against the Americans as rapidly as possible, and Yamaguchi wastes no time in putting up a strike of dive bombers. This is probably a picture of that strike being launched. And these planes are going to go off, uh, execute an attack against the Yorktown, and uh, leave her burning and uh, dead in the water. Of course, Nagumo and Yamaguchi won't know the results of that attack for some time. But in any case, they get their counterpunch in pretty quickly. The question is, well, what do you do for the rest of the afternoon? Contrary to the, the common wisdom regarding Admiral Nagumo, he does not uh, sit a broken man in the sea cabin on the light cruiser Nagara. He actually, as soon as he transfers his flag off of Akagi onto Nagara, he very quickly gets a hold of uh, the battlefield uh, direction and begins assembling what surface forces he can and charging off to the northeast. He, he recognizes that the only way that he can possibly turn this thing around is to somehow get the Americans into a surface fight. And he's operating on intelligence that says that the American carriers seem to be closing on him. Uh, that turns out to be erroneous. But in any case, he feels that you know, they're only 90 miles away. They're over in that direction. I'm going. And this is a relatively gutsy move. Um, at this point, he has 11 destroyers to his name. Six of those are sitting around the burning aircraft carriers. A couple more are sitting around here, you. So he's got a grand total of two old battleships, a couple of heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and I don't know, one or two destroyers. And he's going to come gunning for the 20 odd warships that we have over the horizon somewhere that away. But nevertheless, you know, that's what he feels he has to do, and so off he goes. The question then becomes well, what do you do with the here you? Because the Hiryu obviously has no business in a surface uh, warfare duel of any sort, and she's got all the range that she needs with her aircraft to actually counterattack against the Americans. Her aircraft have a range of over 200 miles, and so obviously she's within easy range. So you look at this and you say, well, prudence might dictate that this would be a good time for Hiryu perhaps to begin opening the range to the Americans, because the situation aboard this carrier now is I've got only 37 aircraft and 27 of those are attack birds. Just by the scale of the attack that has just occurred to me, the Americans have got to have two aircraft carriers out there, and they'll shortly discover that we actually have three. So you have to think to yourself that at some point during the afternoon, here you's air power is going to begin going down into a downward spiral, and at that point, you would like her to be positioned in such a way that you can get out of the battlefield. Because at the end of the day, this is an extremely important, expensive piece of naval hardware that you have here. This represents this ship is years and years worth of you know, cumulative investment. And again, putting on the, uh, the counterfactual history hat, if we look down the road and we say to ourselves, well, what would have happened if during the battles in the Solomons if the Japanese had had the Hiryu along uh, in some of their you know, force structure then? It could have been very, very bad for us. We don't know exactly where here you was relative to Nagumo's forces. We have to infer a lot of this from the communications records, but it's pretty clear that she spends the next rest of the afternoon basically tagging along relatively close to Nagumo's little surface force, and they close the range the entire afternoon until finally uh, at 1500 or thereabouts, Nugumo realizes that I cannot bridge the physical gap that is between me and, and my American adversaries, and he reunites his two little task forces, and they finally begin uh, to break off to the northwest. By this time, it's far too late. Um, at 14.30, here you is sighted by uh, Lieutenant Samuel Adams, who puts in probably the best sighting report of the entire day. Uh, this happens simultaneous with here you's last gasp uh, torpedo plane attack against the Yorktown. Well, it's not going to take too long for the machine to begin gearing up, and sure enough, at 1530 or thereabouts, the Enterprise and the Hornet begin spooling up a large number of dive bombers, and at 1700 hours, they catch the Hiryu, and they turn her flight deck into an inferno. So Yamaguchi, uh, later on in the evening, will make the, the ultimate atonement, and he and the captain of Hiryu will both uh, commit suicide. And that's the end of Yamaguchi. What I find so fascinating about this particular vignette is that here was an opportunity 
for a very strong-willed, outspoken subordinate to potentially influence these, the events of this battle and to influence his superior commander, Nagumo, by saying, you know, we could handle this carrier in a different fashion and still get identical combat results out of it and get a better end game scenario as well. But that's not what happened. And the thing that I find so fascinating is it seems that the scope of vision of both of these leaders as the battle went on and the stresses of defeat became more cumulative, that the scope began to be narrowed down until it became less about what is going on in the strategic big picture and more about how am I comporting myself personally? Am I fighting according to societal norms that are correct? Am I atoning correctly for what's happened uh, during this battle? It's a very different way of thinking. Uh, I think any American carrier admiral probably would have taken the same situation and said, uh, I am leaving fort right, you know, forthrightly and without any embarrassment whatsoever because I need to get this carrier back home. So here was a, a lost opportunity, I would say. <laughs>